Hey everyone, in today's video, we're going to talk about what tools I use when I work on stereos. So I get a lot of questions in my comments section on what tools do I use. Well, this video should answer all of those questions and I'll talk about each one of these items on this table here. Now I think it's worth noting that I am not a professional, if you haven't figured that out already, this is just a hobby for me. And these tools right here are kind of what I consider to be essential for what I do. Uh, others may comment and say, you know, you missed this, or you don't need that, um, and they may be right, and that's fine. Another cool thing about this video is that I'm trying out Amazon Associates for the first time. Most of the items on this table will have a link to them or something similar in the description of this video, and you'll be able to click that link and I'll get a small cut of the purchase if you decide to make a purchase. So if you're looking to buy any of these things, I'd appreciate you using the links in my description to uh, do that. I'm going to start with the smallest, least expensive things first. The first thing being a good Phillips head screwdriver. A commenter on one of my videos pointed out to me that I was not using a JIS standard screwdriver, which a lot of these receivers I'm working on were manufactured in Japan, and Japan uses their own standard of Phillips head screwdriver. Personally, I found this to be very, very similar to a number two Phillips head screwdriver. So if you have a number two Phillips head screwdriver, you should be okay, but if you want to be absolutely proper, get yourself a JIS screwdriver. Next thing that's very important is wire strippers. You want a nice pair of wire strippers because when you're working on receivers, oftentimes you need to cut wires to detach them from circuit boards, then you gotta strip it again to get it reattached to a board or another component. So good wire strippers are very important. Next to wire strippers, we have these little wire cutters or wire snips as I call them. These are uh, Zuron brand. And what's great about these is they allow you to cut leads off of a circuit board very easily. These blades are designed in a way where they can be flush with the circuit board. And once you've soldered your component in, you can bend the lead up, snip it off, and get rid of it. Next on the list is a little tiny pair of needle nose pliers. These are angled and I think that helps in some ways. I got these at Harbor Freight years ago. They were not very expensive. I don't have a good link for these in the description, but I think this is something that a lot of people just have on hand. Standard needle nose pliers will work just fine, but I find these come in handy when you're trying to get a component out of a circuit board and you can't quite get your fingers on it, but you can stick these pliers in here and kind of Pull lightly as you're desoldering the joints and it'll come right out pretty easily. Next really important tool... Well, um... Yeah, funny, I was gonna say, the next really important tool is safety glasses. Because, you know, you're snipping wires, you're soldering, and sometimes when you solder the flux core stuff will splash. You're gonna want to have safety glasses. And make sure they're new and clean too, just do yourself a favor. These are kind of dirty, they're not that new, they're a little scratched up. I could really use a new pair of these. They're really cheap, and it's really going to help me be able to see. And that's definitely worth, you know, $5 in my mind. Next on the list of less expensive things is a set of little tiny screwdrivers. I've got these in the description below. These are great. You've got two Phillips head screwdrivers and four flatheads in here. And what's great about these is... You know, the Phillips head screwdrivers, the biggest one can help you get to uh, tiny Phillips head screws inside of the unit, but these flat heads are extremely helpful for bending leads or trying to wrap things around uh, posts in a uh, circuit board. You can really easily manipulate wires the way you want to if you've got a set of these little tiny screwdrivers. They just come in handy in so many situations. I really highly recommend these. These are on the top of my list for sure. Let's switch from inexpensive tools to some really good materials that I think are really important when you're working on this stuff. First thing being, well, I should have put that out front here, but good solder. This is Kester uh, lead solder. It's flux core, and uh, I've got a link to this exact kind of solder in the description. Uh, since I'm working on mostly stuff from the 70s, it's using lead solder, so you'll want to use lead solder with it also. But another thing, you see what this solder is in. This is a Heiko product. It kind of holds the solder in it and then kind of guides it along the track there. And this is weighted also, so and it's got a rubber base, so when you put it down, the solder's just not going anywhere. It's going to stay right there. And this is really handy when you're working on something. You just take the solder in one hand, pull it to the length you need, and you're good to go. Next material 
is Dow Corning 340 silicone heat sink compound. When you're taking apart a power amplifier and you want to remove the output transistors and apply new thermal compound, this is the stuff to use. This is really high quality stuff. It's a little expensive, but I've had this for years and it has not, you can see I still have quite a bit left, so definitely recommend this stuff to get the best heat transfer from those uh, outputs that definitely need to stay cool when you're playing loud music. And the last material I have to recommend is Deoxid. This is Deoxid D5 and this is Deoxid Fader Lube. Um, I, I recommend watching some videos on Deoxid products to get a better understanding of you know what situations you'd want to use each one of these in. I say if you have a can of Deoxid D5 you're pretty much good to go. This helps clean controls, switches, potentiometers, and uh, fader lube helps clean the same controls that use uh, plastic inside, kind of like the balance slider on a Marantz. You'll use F5 instead of the D5. So now let's get into the more expensive tools, some of the tools that many of you have been asking about. Let's start small, literally, with the Peak Atlas DCA55. This is a semiconductor component analyzer. The way it works is you hook your leads up to a transistor or a diode, it can only have two pins, as long as it's a semiconductor, and it'll tell you everything it can find out about that semiconductor. It'll tell you the pinout, it'll tell you the leakage current, the gain. I use this when I'm trying to find a matched pair for a differential pair on a power amplifier board. This is an excellent tool. I really highly recommend anybody working on this stuff to have one of these so they know what's going on with their transistors and it'll help with finding a good replacement transistor also. Next of course is by Fluke 117 Multimeter. Fluke Multimeters are basically the golden standard. They're some of the best multimeters you can buy. However, you're going to pay for that multimeter because it is the best. This one's a little bit expensive. I've got a link to it in the description. If you want a Fluke but you don't want to break the bank, there is a model called the Fluke 107. I use one of those at work. It's a little bit smaller than this, but it's uh, pretty capable. It can do just about everything you need when it comes to working on these old stereos. And if you want to go even cheaper, well, any multimeter will do for this stuff. But since I do this enough, I wanted a good one that's going to be reliable and accurate for me. Moving closer to the end here, we have my Weller soldering iron. This is a piece of equipment that I get a lot of questions about, and people ask me, you know, what's, what's, what kind of soldering iron should I buy? Well, this was actually a hand-me-down. This was my grandfather's, and he gave it to me, and that's why I'm using it. You know, I haven't had to buy a soldering iron because this has been working just great for me. The way this one works is it has a removable tip, and you can change out the tips on the soldering iron for the uh, temperature you want. Like, this one says 7 right here. That means it's a 700 degree Fahrenheit tip. If I wanted 800, I'd buy a tip that says 8 on here. So, that's not very convenient, but that's how they did it back in the day. Obviously, this is very old. But, in terms of soldering irons, what I would recommend is any soldering iron that has an adjustable temperature control. So, you don't have to worry about switching out your tip or hoping your soldering iron is hot enough or if it's too hot you have control over that. So I've recommended two models in the description. I've got a Weller that has a standalone temperature control and I've got a Heiko. Those soldering irons in my view have everything necessary for working on this kind of gear. I've never used either one however I'm definitely considering buying one of them if I get enough proceeds from uh, you all clicking these links and buying stuff in this video. So if I do get one, I'll be sure to review it and tell you all about it. And now, the last tool with a link in the description is my Heiko FR300. Well, actually, the FR300 is discontinued, so I've added a link for the FR301, the successor of this tool. This is probably the best tool I own, and it makes my work go so much faster, so much more efficiently, and that's because it's just a dang good tool. What this does is it melts solder, and then you pull this trigger, and it sucks it up into this little chamber here. So it's basically a solder vacuum, or solder sucker. It gets the old solder out of the way, and you can just pull the component right out just by going zhoot, zhoot, and you're done. Before I had the Heiko FR300, I used to use this thing. This is just a little spring-loaded pen-type deal, and basically what it does is it creates a small vacuum right here. There's a little plunger inside of here and it sucks the solder up into it 
and then you just kind of put this over a trash can or something and get the solder out once it fills up. These are very inexpensive, I've got a link to one of these in the description. If you're just getting started in this and you don't want to drop the big money on the Heiko FR301, this is a great place to start. These work great and uh, I mean I've had this for over five years now, it's seen quite a few cycles and it still works just fine for me, so highly recommend it. Last note about the Heiko FR301, if you do buy it, you do not have this included with it. I have a link to this in the description. You're definitely going to want to buy this stand for your Heiko FR301 because they just give you this little stamped piece of metal and it makes the uh, makes the tool very unstable. So, you want, so you're going to want the stand. The stand is very helpful. Now I can talk about the stuff that's not in the description. Let's start with this oscilloscope. I don't have any particular oscilloscope I recommend because this is really the only one I've used outside of ones I used briefly in college labs, but the reason you need an oscilloscope is so you can track down signals or measure them. I use my oscilloscope for measuring the uh, power level of power amplifiers at the end of a restoration or the beginning. I've got videos where I do that on this channel. All you need to be able to see really is the waveform for that and be able to know when it's clipping, but it's kind of hard to measure precise, you know, voltage levels with something like this if you don't know exactly what you're doing. So a more modern oscilloscope will be able to tell you exactly what voltage it's seeing on the screen. Those are more expensive though. These can be had very cheap. You can go on eBay, you can find one similar to it, learn how to use it, and you'll be just fine. Along those lines, you'll need probes to go with your oscilloscope, and then, uh, I should have talked about these with the multimeter, but these are just alligator clips. You can find these on Amazon. Very cheap, but very useful for obvious reasons. You can connect things to uh, one another. Then the last thing I've got on here is my dim bulb tester. So I built this using some instructions I found on the internet years ago. And basically all this is, is a power outlet, a power switch, a cut up extension cord, and a little housing here. And then I've modified this power outlet so that the two plugs are in series instead of parallel. And the reason you do that is because you want to get your power amplifier in series with a light bulb. Why would you want to do that? Well, if your amplifier has a really bad short in it, it's going to light up that light bulb. If your amplifier does not have a bad short in it, it should work just fine. And this light might be a little dim, it might not light up at all. But basically, what this is, is it's basically a really cheap, easy way to figure out if there's a bad short in your amplifier. And if there is a bad short, that bulb will light up instead of your receiver starting on fire. I mean, either your receiver's going to start on fire or it's going to trip your breaker. Hopefully it trips your breaker. But if you don't want to have any of that at all, dim bulb tester. Look up how to build one. It's pretty easy, and it's a great tool if you're going to be working on this stuff. So that's all I've got for this video. So thank you so much for watching. If you want to see me use these tools more, be sure to subscribe and check out all the videos on restorations, reviews, whatever I think is interesting, and uh, whatever I think you might find interesting as well. I'll see you in the next one.